and uh, dated uh, today, Josh R- Rogan and Eli Lake. And the idea here is White House is weighing a Syria retreat. What do you mean retreat? It would be an advance into the land of sanity, retreating from the land of lunacy and raving psychosis. That's no retreat. That's a that's progress. So the idea now is, uh, isn't it time to be realistic enough to say, let's work with existing governments? And that happens to be the government of Hafez Assad, thesis that I have supported since October, November 2011 and my visit there, if not sooner. So um, what's the lineup? Uh, it turns out that the people who are saying we've got to de-escalate the conflict while keeping Assad in power, because that's that's obviously the way to do it. How else can you de- de- de-escalate if you're, you're going to have chaos any other way? So this view, the keep Assad in power while de-escalating and de-conflicting, White House national security staff, including the senior coordinator for Middle East policy, Rob Malley, and this is this guy who came from the International Crisis Group, and he had a somewhat dubious uh, pedigree, but still, there it is. And this also meshes with somebody that, that we haven't heard too much about, Stefan de Mistura. De Mistura, and I covered this when it all came out, right? There was a study written that talked about the need for local ceasefires, local armistices. And de Mistura has been doing it. Uh, going around and uh, setting up uh, local truces, local peace, local um, deconfliction, uh, and going on. But now, the National Security Council view is opposed by top officials in other parts of the government, especially Secretary of State John Skull and Bones Kerry and U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, her loopiness, this humanitarian bomber, the one who weaponized human rights for purposes of her own genocide. All right. Uh, now, remember, this takes us back to April 2014. You remember when, uh, after Obama had said, uh, no, 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 I'm sick and tired of going into these wars. I'm not going to do it. You remember this article, I think the Wall Street Journal, where Kerry and Samantha were reaching out to warmongers outside the administration to try to increase the pressure on Obama, and this was leaked, David Petraeus was one of those. Now, it's clear. Petraeus probably said, look, I'm too smelly right now. I'm just coming out of my Broadwell phase. You know, I've just been wrapped with what amounts to a felony where most people would have been in jail for a few years. I can't do it, but I'll get you my friend. Allen, John Allen can be the ISIS R. And then on the other side, Uh, They also went to General Keene, Jack Keene, which is the um, uh, Institute for the Study of War. It is the Kagan faction, right? Donald Kagan, Frederick Kagan, Kim Kagan, that entire crew of neocon fascist mad persons. So here's a fight. Uh, We have all kinds of people weighing in. We'll, We'll give you a synthesis of this. Um, Frederick Hof, uh, this Hof, I think, is the State Department guy who apparently thought that the uh, the way to uh, to get peace was indeed to accept Assad, right? So this is uh, Mali is for this, and Philip Gordon has written an article about it. The Philip Gordon article, I think, is in Politico a little while ago, and Philip Gordon, the previous NSC director on this portfolio says pretty much the same thing. Now, let's see who's against it. We want to mention a couple of the main names. Uh, Other officials told us that while the U.S. still has programs in place to aid the moderate terrorist opposition, top members of the administration who have been pushing for more of that support or for the establishment of safe zones in Syria are increasingly frustrated with the White House's reluctance. Maybe they sent a drone to take that message to Obama. This group includes Kerry and General John Allen, 
the outgoing special envoy of the anti-Islamic state coalition. So Alan, as we identified correctly, is, along with Kerry, one of those who are frustrated and they're trying to sabotage Obama's policy. Now I ask you, if you're a libertarian, if you're a Paul Tard, if you're uh, a Mush, well, no, Mushhead wouldn't, but a LaRouche, you're going to be attacking Obama from morning till night. So I hope you get your engraved thank you note from Kerry, Samantha Power, and uh, indeed Alan saying thank you for making our warmonger task e e easier. Obama's speech, press conference last Friday, no more mumbo jumbo and no half-baked ideas. Now, there are some promising ideas in the U.S. bureaucracy. Let's see if we can just uh, sum up a couple of those. There is now the idea that you could um, attack Raqqa, that the U.S. seems to be promoting what was going on at the end of July already. Try to have an attack on Raqqa by, I think, Kurds. It looks like uh, 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 the, essentially the, the Syrian Kurds going in to attack Raqqa, the ISIS uh, capital. Um, there's also more, more and more focus on this critical area, the 65 miles west of the Euphrates, because that's the Royal Road, right? That's the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That's the artery where all the seniors of war come into ISIS. You cut that, ISIS withers on the vine. It's a rabble. It's the JE, intramural. Intramural JE, how about that? Uh, and it's a paper tiger, so it's Russian. It went to Russia. Back. Welcome to the second hour of a World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. And now we have uh, something uh, out of the ordinary. We are now going to go to Moscow and get uh, a report on the uh, view of Syria and the Middle East from the Russian capital. And our guest is uh, Stanislav Bishok, who is, uh, first of all, uh, one of the leading scholars in the world on the problem of neo-Nazism and fascism in Ukraine. He's the one who knows most about the Kiev uh, fascist clique uh, and his institutional Location is the um, International Monitoring Organization, which is known as CISEMO, Commonwealth of Independent States hyphen Election Monitoring Organization. We've had him on in, in the past, and uh, he's a friend of the program. So, Stanislav, welcome. Can you tell us now how the Russian government, the Russian elites, the Russian people view? this situation. And we have to say at the beginning, we want to congratulate the Russian armed forces for showing uh, that with, uh, with a, you know, a certain uh, force, you can then actually uh, break up ISIS. You can break up these other terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, Nusra, whatever they are. Please tell us all about it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on your show once again. It's a pleasure and it's an honor. And uh, 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 f uh, uh, Russian public as well as Russian elites are uh, predominantly supportive of the actions taken by uh, the Russian military in Syria. And uh, Russian people are, you know, are somewhat uh, sympathetic uh, towards Syria because we know that uh, there is a Christian minority there in Syria and it is uh, being under protection of the current government because right. the current government is uh, secular, so it uh, uh, supports and uh, it protects all religions uh, of the region. And uh, uh, unlike uh, their uh, moderate or non so moderate. Uh, oppositional uh, counterparts. So by and large, uh, Russian public is supportive of our troops and supportive of our actions to uh, liberate Syria of the Islamic terrorists and uh, to uh, support the uh, legitimate, uh, uh, legitimate government of uh, President Bashar Assad. All right, great. Now, the, the complication that we see from here is always that the United States has claimed right, that they were attacking ISIS, but didn't do it. It's a kind of a phony war. 
um, declared, but then not carried out. Obviously, with this thought that eventually the CIA could turn ISIS against Iran or maybe send them to Chechnya or someplace in the Caucasus, Transcaucasus, and create other problems, maybe even in, in Central Asia. I, what I'd be interested to know is when you look at the Russian press, how prominent is that theme? In other words, the hypocrisy, the duplicity of the U.S., like claiming to be anti-terrorism, but then having proposals like David Petraeus says the United States should ally with al-Qaeda or Nusra. Uh, it's ridiculous, and uh, uh, Russian public uh, and Russian uh, uh, experts are really, uh, they really uh, cannot uh, comprehend uh, the position of the American elites and of some uh, Western elites who uh, blame Russia for the for uh, our actions in uh, Syria, who say that our actions are um, unnecessary, uh, uh, ill prepared and so on and so forth, or that uh, they say that our actions uh, can uh, uh, exacerbate the uh, Syrian crisis and so on and so forth, because we know that uh, uh, by far uh, the uh, Western uh, support, uh, quote-unquote, for uh, uh, moderate, uh, so-called uh, moderate opposition in Syria uh, didn't uh, lead to to the uh, destruction, to the dissolution of ISIS. Uh, and But now, uh, as uh, Russia in the game, so to speak, uh, now uh, uh, we see that the uh, Syrian people, they, uh, uh, re they are really uh, happy with Russian involvement because uh, it gives them hope. They hope that uh, Russia is uh, a country uh, they can rely on in this uh, uh, in the uh, counter-terrorist uh, actions because uh, unlike the West, Russia has had its own uh, uh, has had its own uh, bad times uh, dealing with uh, Islamic terrorists. For example, uh, we can. Uh, I can remind you of uh, the first and the second Chechen wars. It was uh, inside Russia, and so we know who these people are. We know what they are capable of. We know uh, what atrocities they are capable of doing, and so on and so forth. So it's not just uh, for us. It's not uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, action movie or so. Or we know this just by our own experience, uh, blood experience, and very tragic. And so we know uh, what the people of Syria are. Uh, experiencing at the moment and have been experiencing during the uh, four bloody years of this civil war, or uh, if truth be told, it, it's not real civil war, because uh, those oppo opposing uh, the uh, Syrian uh, army are not uh, predominantly, uh, are not Syrians. They right. come from abroad, they come from elsewhere, they come from Europe, and so on and so forth. So it's it's the gang of uh, in, really, uh, it's really international uh, Islamic terrorist, in, terrorism, and not just Syrian Islamic terrorism. They, just, uh, just, yeah. Just on that point, right, uh, in effect, we've had all of these so-called clergymen, right, the ulema of Saudi Arabia, yeah. who have been lining up, and they're essentially declaring holy war or jihad against Russia. And uh, what's the uh, what's the response to that? Well, Russian public is generally outraged by that uh, by the by those uh, statements. But at the same time, uh, we have known for a long time uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is somewhat involved in the uh, terrorist activities uh, throughout the Middle East and uh, North Africa. So uh, uh, the, uh, today or uh, recently, uh, for the first time, they have uh, openly uh, claimed. That they have openly declared they, their uh, belligerence towards Russia, towards uh, secular Syria, and uh, uh, so to speak, towards uh, all the uh, free world. Uh, so now uh, it, it was not a secret for us there, uh, you know, because the uh, Saudi uh, government uh, uh, practices radical forms of Islam. Uh, uh, so-called Wahhabi Islam, 
and so um, well now now we now they just uh, declared it openly and now uh, everybody who has eyes or ears just can uh, understand can can understand what the Saudis really are I mean their government yes and that I think that's a 